Hey, it's Laura. I'm taking a little time off to spend it with family during the holidays, so I pulled a great episode out of the archives for you that I think will help you make better financial goals for next year and achieve them faster. Enjoy it, and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, wherever you and yours are. I hope you have some really nice time off to relax and reflect on how well this year went or didn't go and maybe what you want to do differently next year to have different results. And I'll be back with you next week with a brand new episode. Achieving your financial goals is all about getting one step closer to the life you daydream about, where you feel happy, secure, and on top of the world. In this podcast, we're going to talk about why you need to set financial goals. I'll give you a specific method to create them, giving you the greatest chances of success and clever ways to achieve your goals as fast as possible and have goals that feel fun and motivating, not restrictive or boring. Hey, everyone, and thanks for joining me this week. I'm Laura Adams, personal finance and small business expert and author who's been right here hosting the Money Girl podcast every week since 2008. My mission for the show is to help you get the knowledge and motivation to prioritize your finances, build wealth, and have more security and less stress. Each podcast is kind of like a mini tutorial, like a class where we cover money hacks, new ways to earn more, how to save more, or we might hear from an industry expert on a specific financial or small business topic. You're going to come away with practical advice for taking your financial wellness to the next level and know how to make better money decisions. So I would love for you to subscribe to the show if you haven't done that already. And of course, participate. You can send me your money questions or comments. I'm going to cover your questions at the end of each show. So send them in by leaving a voice message 24-7 on our line. All you have to do is call 302-364-0308. And if you don't want your voice on the show, you can just tell me that. You can also email me using my contact page at lauradadams.com or connect with me on Instagram at lauradadams. And we always publish a companion blog post that's called the show notes in the Money Girl section at quickanddirtytips.com. Today's episode is number 702 called Seven Steps to Achieve Your Financial Goals Faster. So let's talk about why you need goals. I mean, you know, for a lot of people that may sound sort of fundamental. And while everyone is different, we've all got things that we want, you know, whether it's a new car, a home remodel, uh, no more student debt, a secure retirement, maybe going on a a vacation around the world. I mean, we're all so different. We all have different goals. So you need to identify yours. And the problem is that very few people actually make a plan to achieve what they want. Instead, they kind of wander around aimlessly just hoping that one day all of these things that are in their head are just going to magically happen. So I want to invite you to dream with me for a moment. What if you decided right now to get serious about using your money to build the dream life that you crave? What if you committed to setting financial goals and creating a crystal clear plan for achieving them? You've only got a finite amount of money to work with each month. That's true for all of us. So using that money to reach your goals is critical for building a life that you love and enjoy. So that's why financial goal setting is so important. It really lays the foundation. And I'm going to talk about seven steps to achieve your financial goals as quickly as possible. So let's get into it. Number one, write down your financial goals. And maybe if you don't write them, maybe you type them into a document, into some kind of digital format. I want to ask you, who do you think is more likely to achieve their goals? Someone who just has a vague idea of what their goals should be or someone who's put them clearly down in writing? Yeah, you get it. The person who writes them down is definitely more likely to achieve the goals because they've thought them through. They've formulated them. They've you know really clarified what their goals are. In fact, a study found that you're 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. So it's pretty cool, right? Simply by doing that, you're going to increase your chances of success significantly. So 
Take 30 minutes today or even 15 minutes today to write down your financial goals or type them into a Google Doc or into a spreadsheet. Aim high, hold nothing back. Maybe you want to save for an amazing vacation. Maybe you want to start a joint venture. Maybe you want to buy an investment property. Maybe you want to increase your income, invest for your kid's college education, or increase your cryptocurrency holdings. Whatever your goal is, write it down, no matter how out of reach it may seem to you right now. So that is step number one. Get it down in a digital form or literally on a piece of paper. All right, step number two is create SMART goals. So SMART is a classic goal-setting technique that helps you increase your chances of success. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. Let me give you an example. Let's say you write down, I want to save more for retirement. Well, I mean, that's a good goal, but it does not create a specific roadmap for how you're going to do it. But if you use the SMART formula, it will prompt you to go deeper. So here's what I'm talking about. So for the S, specific, you may say, I want to max out my 401k this year. The maximum amount I can save is $19,500. That's pretty specific. The M in SMART is measurable. It might be you jot down, I will adjust my income tax withholding at work on Monday so that I can put $812.50 of my biweekly paycheck in my 401k. That will allow me to save $19,500 this year. That's pretty measurable. So you're either doing that on a biweekly basis with your paycheck or you're not. You can measure if it is getting done. The A in SMART is achievable. So you might put down, I will achieve this financial goal by reducing my monthly expenses and saving any bonuses or overtime pay I receive. Realistic is the R. I will reduce my monthly expenses by eating out only once a week and reducing the data limit on my cell phone plan. So those are some ways that you might make it realistic for you. And the last T is time-based. I will accomplish my goal of maxing out my retirement account by the end of the year. You put a specific time frame on it. So at that time, you know that you either achieved the goal or you didn't. You can use this SMART formula to create short-term or long-term goals. For instance, you might want to save a certain amount within a few months to take a vacation before the end of the year, or you may have a dream to save $5 million for retirement over many decades. All right, the third step is track your cash flow. How much money do you make each month? How much do you spend each month? Knowing the answers to those questions is what it means to track your cash flow. The easiest way to monitor your income and expenses is to use a budgeting app. Now, before I lose you with the budget word, I don't believe that budgets should be super restrictive. In fact, I prefer to use the term spending plan because you should have a plan for where your money will go each month. Back in podcast number 700, just a few weeks ago, I covered 20 best personal finance and small business digital tools. You're going to find some really great technology in that show that you can use to track, create, you know, monitor your budget or your spending plan. So I would encourage you to check out that show and choose out one or more tools to try out. Number four, allow flexibility in your spending. So when you get started with your financial goals, you're probably going to feel really fired up and motivated. You're going to be willing to cut out loads of expenses or, you know, do whatever it takes to get there as quickly as possible. But if your financial goals are significant and they challenge you, the shine of making those sacrifices to achieve them is probably going to start to wear off within a few months into your journey. You might lose a little steam and wonder, you know, why am I depriving myself of everything now when retirement seems so far away? Well, the secret to staying motivated is to leave a little wiggle room in your spending plan for things you enjoy. And I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. So again, allow some flexibility in your spending. Number five, increase your disposable income. Disposable income is what you've got left over to spend after taxes. So obviously, the more disposable income you have, the faster you can achieve your financial goals. So I would encourage you to brainstorm ways to boost it by increasing your gross income or decreasing your expenses or ideally doing both. So consider negotiating a raise with your boss or going for a a promotion. 
You might want to start a side hustle. You could declutter your home and sell any excess stuff that you're not using on Poshmark or eBay to increase your income. To decrease your expenses, try cutting out things like subscription services. Uh, You might want to try cooking at home more or creating a debt reduction plan to slash your interest expenses. And if you're interested in starting a side hustle, I definitely want to recommend that you check out my latest book. It's called Money Smart Solopreneur, a personal finance system for freelancers, entrepreneurs, and side hustlers. It is an Amazon number one new release, and it's going to give you everything that you need to get your side business or your, you know, your side gig up and running and make sure that you're doing everything that you need to do. And, and I would say personally for me, having business income, whether it's a full-time business or a side income, has really been the secret for me being able to invest more and to have more wealth over the years. So don't ever underestimate the ability to you know, earn a second source of income or you know, have a completely different source of income with new opportunities. All right, step number six is reward yourself and significant milestones. Most financial goals are pretty, you know, pretty challenging. So in addition to being flexible and leaving a little wiggle room in your cash flow for things you enjoy, you may also want to create a system where you reward yourself when you hit some significant milestones. For example, let's say your goal is to build a $10,000 emergency fund. You might break that down into four smaller milestones, like you're going to save $2,500, then you're going to save $5,000, then you're going to have $7,500, and then $10,000. You might give yourself something special after you hit each one of those smaller milestones. You know, maybe it's getting a massage, buying a new book, or going out for a great meal, whatever, you know, gets you excited, make sure that you are really rewarding yourself for for the good work that you're doing. All right, step number seven, find an accountability partner. So beyond writing down your goals, monitoring your cash flow, and just, you know, putting in the hard work, the most important thing you can do to reach your dreams is sharing them with other people. Telling people you trust about what you genuinely want to achieve with your money reinforces your goals, and it actually creates some accountability to to make sure that you do them. It also gets other people interested in seeing you reach your dreams. So think for a moment, who is the right person to keep you fired up and motivated to achieve your financial goals? Who would give you a little nudge when you get off track? Who's going to be honest with you? Maybe it's a family member, a friend, or even an online community of like-minded people. Maybe you'll find that in my private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars. That's a really great group of people who are asking good questions. They're achieving great goals. And I think that is a fantastic community to help make sure that you stay motivated. Now, a lot of you may be thinking, well, Laura, I'm just not sure what my financial goals should be or maybe what order I should achieve them. I've got 10 ideas for you here. And really, I'm going to give them to you in order of priority. So number one is build a cash reserve. This is so important so that you can handle unexpected financial emergencies. You want to make this one a priority. You've got to achieve this goal first so you won't be caught off guard by something unexpected like losing your job, having an expensive medical bill, or needing a car repair. All right, the second goal to consider is to max out your employer's 401k match. So not necessarily the full 401k, but but just contribute enough to get the match because that's free money. Getting the max is going to vary depending on what's offered in your workplace, but it might translate into saving 2 or 3% of your income. Number three, increase those contributions to your retirement account. So as you can, bump up those contributions every year. That's going to make sure you build security for the future. And if you don't have a 401k at work or you're self-employed, you can open your own retirement account. It could be an individual retirement account. That's an IRA. Or maybe if you're self-employed, you might be looking at a SEP IRA or a solo 401k. Whatever type you use, slowly boost your retirement contributions until you max out the account. 
All right, the fourth goal to consider is to max out a health savings account or HSA. That can really cut the cost of health care, but you've got to have an HSA eligible health plan to qualify. It will allow you to pay for a variety of medical expenses on a tax free basis. All right, the fifth goal to consider is, like I mentioned, increase your income so you've got more disposable income to save and invest. I would encourage you to check out a prior podcast, number 650, called Five Tips for Building a Side Business. That will give you some ideas and inspiration to create an additional source of income. All right. Goal number six to consider is pay off your high interest debt. That will reduce your interest expense as much as possible. And if you need a step-by-step guide to create a debt reduction plan, do not miss my best-selling online class called Get Out of Debt Fast, a proven plan to stay debt-free forever. You can find a link in the show or you can find a link to that course at my website, lauradadams.com. It will really jumpstart your debt reduction plan. Goal number seven to consider is purchase insurance. You need to fill any coverage gaps that you may have, such as a health plan, term life insurance, or long-term disability insurance. Insurance is so important for protecting everything that you've worked so hard to, to build. So don't go without key policies. Goal number eight, save for your next vacation so you can pay for it in cash instead of credit. Goal number nine might be saving for a home down payment. Now, owning a home is not for everybody, but if it is something that you want to do, the more that you can save now, the more you can reduce your monthly mortgage payment and interest later on. And goal number 10 might be contributing to a 529 savings plan. That is a tax-advantaged account that you can use to pay for college expenses for you or a child or even up to $10,000 a year for private school for a child. If you can choose one or two either short or long-term goals that you can tackle this year, I promise you, your financial life will leapfrog and your very happy future self will thank you. So I hope that will get you jump-started to to be thinking about goals. Now, let's get on to your questions. Uh, I've got a couple here to cover. The first one comes from Russell, who says, First, thank you so much for your show and what you do. I recently discovered your podcast and can't get enough of it. What I love most about it, particularly in comparison to other financial podcasts, is how short and succinct each of your podcast is. There's no fluff, and each podcast is very well titled so that I can pick and choose what I want to learn. I'm a W-2 employee falling in the highest tax bracket and on a fairly good financial footing. I have no debt except my primary mortgage. I've got five months expenses set aside in cash as an emergency fund. I max out my 401k. I've got a backdoor Roth IRA and I max out an HSA every year and generally invest a healthy amount in taxable accounts. Here's my question. As I save for certain short to medium-term goals, such as buying an investment property or a new car, for example, where should I put that money? Assuming that it would take me about two years to reach my goal, should I just put the cash in a savings account? Or are there other options that might offer better rates of return? What if I invested into an S&P 500 index fund each month with the cash I'm saving for a goal that I want to reach in about two years. I'm thinking that since this is not an emergency fund, if it wasn't a good time to withdraw the money, I could theoretically delay for a year or so. Any other options you would recommend? Well, Russell, thank you, thank you for your kind words about the show. That's just awesome feedback. And that's exactly why I keep producing the show week after week with no fluff, as you mentioned. I love your question, and I think it fits super nicely with today's topic. First of all, congrats on doing so, so well with your finances by having a cash reserve, maxing out multiple tax advantage accounts, and still investing more in taxable accounts. You're in a really good position, so I'm going to send you a virtual high five right now. You are doing great. Since you've got an emergency fund, which I'm assuming is in a super safe place, like a bank savings account because you said it was in cash, you have a lot more latitude for handling money dedicated to your short-term goals, which I generally define as less than two to three years. And I totally understand wanting to earn more than a fraction of a percent on that money while also keeping it relatively safe. So here are some ideas. 
you might keep all or a portion of it in a high interest savings account. If you go to a comparison site such as finder.com, you can find a review of the best accounts. For instance, right now, the best option is paying 0.7% on balances up to $10,000 and 0.45% on amounts above $10,000. This account has no annual fee. Now, I know that's still not stellar, but it's definitely gonna beat a typical savings account. Another option is putting the funds in a short-term CD, such as a 12-month product or maybe even a 24-month product if you know you won't need the money for, for two years. However, right now, they're paying about the same as the best high-yield savings rate that I mentioned. So that's not going to do you any good. It would be better just to have it in a savings account rather than lock it up in a CD. And as you mentioned, you could invest all or a portion of your money earmarked for your short-term goals in an index fund, as long as you're willing to have a potential loss in the account right at the time you're ready to buy the car or the investment property or whatever it is that you want to purchase. So again, you know, you're in a little bit of a better position than many people because you've got lots of financial cushion in your life. So I would say if you do want to invest, you know, maybe half of it, um, that might be uh, okay for you because you're in a, in a good position, even if it did drop in value just a little bit. So thanks so much, Russell, and I, I hope that helps. I got another question from Gladys who says, I have questions about how to invest or make money the safe and smart way because I'm afraid to take risks. You make me feel that I can do it and that anybody can accomplish changes in life. And Gladys said many, many more kind and generous things. Uh, So thank you so much, Gladys. I really am honored to have you in the Money Girl community. And yes, everyone, and I mean everyone, can make small or even big changes in their financial lives and have more security, they can build wealth, and have less financial stress. So Gladys, a good show for you to check out is podcast number 531 called Eight Investing Rules to Follow Even When the Stock Market Drops. In that show, I really kind of drill down to the difference between saving and investing. Even though we use those terms kind of interchangeably, you shouldn't confuse them. They're not the same thing. With saving, you're putting money aside without exposing it to any risk or very little risk, such as in a savings account, a money market deposit account, or a CD. Investing is when you commit money to an endeavor with the expectation that you're going to make a profit or make some income. And there's obviously risk to that. The risk is that you'll receive less than you expect or worse yet, a possibility that you could lose your entire investment. So what I would recommend that you do is think about saving and investing as a kind of a long scale. At one end, it can be super duper conservative. And on the other end, it can be extremely risky. What I want you to do is find somewhere right in the middle that makes you feel comfortable. Investing does not have to be super risky. Yes, it always is going to involve some amount of risk, but you know, ultimately you're going to find a level of risk that you're comfortable with. And you know, if there's one rule of investing that you should always remember, it is that you should never expose money to more risk than is necessary to accomplish your goals. So you want to take a step back and be clear about why you're either saving or investing in the first place. In general, you want to be saving for short-term goals like we talked about with Russell, but you want to be investing for long-term goals because uh, you're going to need higher yielding investments. If there was no risk to getting a big return on your money, everyone would run to the highest yielding investments. But because they bring risks, they've got to be used carefully. So, you know, risk does create attention and it it does keep many people from getting started investing. But taking calculated investment risk is a really important part of your financial life. Without it, your money will not grow fast enough to achieve your long-term goals. But keeping your money safe and cozy in a low interest savings account doesn't let it grow at all. So this is why I'm saying you need to be somewhere in the middle. The reality is that not taking enough risk can be the riskiest move of all because you could fall short of your goals and run out of money during retirement or not even be able to retire. 
So whether you avoid risk intentionally or if you've just been procrastinating investing, it really could be devastating to your financial future. So Gladys, I would encourage you to think about just slowly getting started and looking at investments that are more balanced, um, you know, things like index funds that are very, very diversified and, and don't offer much risk. You know, again, they're not going to be the highest returns out there, but that's okay. You know, it's all about a calculated risk. I hope that helps. If you have not yet joined my free private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars, like I mentioned, it is an amazing group of people. If you want to get into the group, you can search for it on Facebook or text the word dollars, D-O-L-L-A-R-S, to the number 33444, and I'll send you an invitation. And of course, you can also visit lauradadams.com where you'll find my contact page and more about me, my books, and online courses. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, here's to living a richer life. Money Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Steve Rickyberg with script editing by Adam Cecil. Our operations and editorial manager is Michelle Margulis. Our assistant manager is Emily Miller. And our marketing and publicity assistant is Davina Tomlin. Davina Tomlin.